Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for um, showing up for today's um, workshop today. Um, my name is Laura Smith and I am a new instructional designer with City. Um, this is my first workshop. Um, so I'm very excited to be here to join you all and to present on a topic of interest to me. Um, and that is formative assessments. So one of the reasons I selected formative assessments is because, well, a couple, there are a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it's timely. Um, it, we're you know, nearing mid semester, midterms are coming up or perhaps they've already occurred, I'm not sure. Um, but these are changes you could make at midterm without having to overhaul your syllabus or with the need to overhaul your syllabus right now. Um, you know, going into midterm and for the remainder of the semester. Um, also formative assessments, as you'll see, I hope are practical, um, easy to implement um, when your hands are full. And again, you've got a lot on your plate um, and you want to make some quick changes or just to assess where your students are at right now. Um, you can do that with formative assessments. Um, so just a, a few um, housekeeping items about today's um, workshop. So we're going to take about an hour for this workshop until one. And I do understand that there is the town hall occurring. So if you need to skip over to that, I absolutely understand considering the topic. But again, I appreciate your being here. Um, we're going to be using some polling and the chat features for to have some interactivity. Um, and if, just a, a few reminders that while the session is being recorded, so you can come back to it at a later time if you need to leave. Um, and it will be added to the city's YouTube playlist, which we're gradually building and sharing um, with faculty. So you can have those resources at your fingertips. Um, just a friendly reminder to mute yourself when I'm presenting, but um, if you have questions or want to interject and offer some comments, please feel free to do so. I want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, or, or you may use the chat. I have a chat uh, window open, so I'll be monitoring that as well. Uh, you're free to use your video, of course. Hopefully you can see mine. I want to make sure and make this as you know, personal as possible, considering we're all spread out often at our homes or alone in our offices trying to engage with one another. So um, please you know, feel free to use your video and um, microphones for that reason. So here are learning objectives for today. We have a handful of objectives we're going to get through. Number one, we're going to be defining formative assessment. So what is formative assessment? We'll be distinguishing between formative and summative assessments. Um, you'll be, ex by the end of the session, you'll be able to explain the importance of formative assessment as a tool to enhance student engagement and learning retention. We're going to take a look at four different types of formative assessment techniques, both useful for the synchronous and asynchronous classrooms. So you'll have an opportunity to see an example and engage in um, four different formative assessment techniques, sort of see them in action during this workshop. And then hopefully you'll be making a plan to integrate formative assessments into your classroom. And that's the big takeaway from this workshop. So a few food for thought, I um, just wanted to bring to your attention some good reads of note on assessment techniques, ones that have recently inspired me and hope that you'll uh, reference as well as you explore both online teaching, but also different types of small teaching techniques you can integrate in your online classroom or hybrid or face-to-face -face classroom as well. So um, this first text uh, I recently read um, really wonderful, very inspirational by James Lang. It's called Small Teaching, Everyday Lessons from the Science of Learning. And it, it includes some great evidence-based kind of practical application of, application of small te teaching techniques, sort of small adjustments that you can make to your weekly teaching plans that have a really big payoff in terms of student learning and engagement. And then also a kind of seminal text on the subject, um, Angelo and Cross's Classroom Assessment Techniques, a handbook for college teachers. Um, it includes a, just a comprehensive list with um, you know, curriculum guides on 
practical guidance on classroom assessment techniques and how to implement them in your classroom. So I've provided links to both of those and I would recommend that you uh, check them out. So first we're gonna do a poll. Um, I have not done a poll here in um, a workshop, so bear with me as I try to figure this out, but um, we're going to, I'm going to switch screens here and go to my first poll question with poll, oops, not that. Here we go. All right. All right, hopefully you all can see the first um, poll question and uh, directions at the top for how to respond to it. So this is just a general open-ended question. Um, you can respond by phone or on your desktop. And the first question is, how do you know your students are learning? How do you measure their understanding? Feel free to put in whatever you like, just how you gauge your students' learning in the classroom. See any responses yet? Feel free to put them in the chat if you aren't able to interact in the, with the poll for any reason, and I can take a look at the chat as well. There we go, verbal feedback, great. Assessments, yes name of the game here. All right, quizzes. Any others, verbal feedback, assessments, quizzes, all excellent ways of gauging student learning. TBL. Oh, team-based learning, yes. Took me a moment there to <laughs> figure that out. Engagement in the discussions or lecture time. Excellent, yes, great. Any others? These are all great. OSCEs, yes. Um, one I've really yet to explore here in practice at Rush, but I know that they're, they're wonderful and they're used with great, um, um, very, very effectively. CEX, I'm not familiar with that. Maybe you could elaborate that in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, Paula, you said polling in the chat. Great. Um, Shauna, survey on discussion board. Excellent. Absolutely. These are all great techniques. I'm going to go back to my presentation here. Homework. <laughs> homework. Yes, my kids are upstairs doing their homework right now. Assessments, group discussions, poll everywhere questions to assess content presented in lecture. You guys are on top of it. You may not even need me. <laughs> well, I hope you do, but um, great, great examples here. So let's go back to the presentation. All right, hopefully you guys are back on my slides here. Let me know if not. Um, Okay, so I think, hold on just a moment. I wanna make sure I'm seeing, just negotiating this on my home computer is interesting. There we go. All right, so it looks like most of you, you will use a variety of things, right? Um, you use, but a lot of you do use assessments to evaluate your students and measure their learning, right? So just so we have a baseline of where to start, um, we all know what assessments are, but let's just define it for the sake of, you know, uh, knowing exactly how they can be defined. So assessments are methods or tools that educators use to evaluate, measure, and document the academic readiness, learning progress, skill acquisition, or educational needs of students. Um, so there are many different types of assessment methods, right? Um, Historically, though, faculty tend to rely on summative assessment techniques. 
um, to measure student learning. And we, these are super important, right? And they're often necessary, but what about other approaches? So let's take a look at some other kinds of um, assessment techniques, specifically formative assessment, which again is the subject of today's workshop. So what is formative assessment? Um, well, they, it, they are assessment techniques by which the instructor can monitor student learning, let me get my little pointer here, and provide ongoing feedback through a course. Um, they are often short, simple, spontaneous, and easy to implement. Formative assessments often have low or no stakes. This is essentially what that means is they're either no stakes, they're often ungraded, so they have real no consequence on the student's grade or performance in the class, or they're worth very few points or weighted very um, small in the overall grade. Um, sometimes they're anonymous. They're often informal, spontaneous, and often or sometimes group oriented, though they can be individually performed. They can be delivered in or outside of the classroom. And a great thing about formative assessments is that feedback is often usually immediate or sent shortly thereafter. It's easy for faculty to provide feedback um, or respond to the student either that day, the following class, which we know is um, really important for student learning. So formative assessments are very often student-centered, meaning it empowers the students, give them, gives them more control over their learning, uh, their ability to assess their learning and their progress in the course. But also, and I think that's it's an equally important, they're faculty driven uh, and that the faculty can use these quick kind of assessment techniques to really understand what their students or if their students are learning and to make adjustments as needed. Um, so they give the faculty a lot of power too to control the kind of direction in which their course is heading. Um, as, in we, as we just saw in Angelo's book, um, they're otherwise known as classroom assessment techniques or CATS, right? That's another word um, used uh, interchangeably often with formative assessments. So we can contrast that with summative assessments, right? So now that we're clear on what formative assessments are, we can better clarify summative assessments technique, techniques that you're perhaps more familiar with. So um, assess, summative assessments are assessment tools that focus on the outcome of learning, often um, given at the end of the unit, a course or a program. Um, they're often lengthier, more involved, they require lots of planning and extensive grading. For example, a midterm exam, a final project, a final paper, right? Um, you often, and I imagine you all do, spend a lot of time developing summative assessment assignments um, and also even more time evaluating them once you get them from your students, right? Um, they're often high stakes in that these final projects, exams, et cetera, are typically heavily weighted in the overall grade, right? Um, the student's overall grade is, um, is very much affected by how they perform in these summative assessments. And they're often pretty formal, right? Um, and they're focused on individual performance, like this, um, this stressed out redhead kid here on the right who's laboring over his um, uh, exam, likely with the clock ticking is a great example of <laughs> the stressors of a summative assessment, right? They're often written. Typically, students get delayed feedback, meaning you know it takes us a while, right, as faculty to evaluate these exams or papers and to get them back to our students, right. So um, the feedback is often delayed by a week or two or more, depending on how long it might take you to um, complete that grading. And they typically tend to be more teacher controlled in terms of the content of the exam, the format, how it's delivered, etc. So why use formative assessments? So some really uh, important things to remember is that um, formative assessments create checks for understand, understanding. So uh, they help you to identify whether or not your students are really getting what you're teaching them. They, they really reinforce learning, they drive home main points and they provide just in time feedback. So again, with the quick feedback to students uh, students are often able to better self-assess their learning um, and to improve upon it uh, throughout the duration of the course. So they create opportunities for student improvement and engagement. 
um, and really empower students to take control of their learning. And for faculty, I think, which is uh, important for, uh, for you guys, is that they, you know, they help you to improve your own teaching strategies and your course in real time. You can make adjustments to your teaching based on how students perform in these formative assessments um, to hopefully overall improve their performance overall in the course. And then they also support your summative assessments, right? They can be aligned. You can align your formative and summative assessments as well as you know, overall aligning them to your module and course objectives so that everything sort of reinforces the other. And, and that's what's great about how well formative and summative assessments work together is that they do reinforce the other as long as they're appropriately and correctly aligned. Um, so I'm not saying that one type is better than the other. Definitely each has its place um, and summative assessments um, are really important and, cr and critical in courses to really evaluate uh, students. But I'm just suggesting that perhaps you sprinkle in some formative assessment techniques um, in your course um, to complement what you already have. And I've brought in this great quote by Angelo and Cross um, that really elaborates on that. To improve their learning, students need to receive appropriate and focused feedback early and often. And they also need to know how to assess their own learning. And some formative assessments um, really enable um, students to do that. And also another great reason is um, inter interspersing formative assessments in your course helps you to be compliant with Russia's uni Rush University's online course design standards. So, um, specifically in standard number 30 under assessment, um, you are evaluated as to whether or not your course includes frequent formative assessments. And if you do that and provide evidence for that, then you easily um, comply with that standard. So yet another great reason to do it. So probably what you're all here for is to take a look at some specific techniques. So next we're gonna take a closer look at a few formative assessments that you can easily implement in your online or your hybrid classroom. And there, there are really so many out there uh, that we couldn't possibly talk about all of them. Um, and you may have some that you already use or that you use, but you don't even know that they're formative assessments. So um, we're just going to kind of formalize that a bit and talk about some specific ones that are both easy to implement, um, but also very effective. Uh, and just to FYI, I made this word cloud here, uh, another great uh, sort of um, interaction you could do in your classroom with wordart.com. It's one of many um, word art um, applications out there, um, just uh, showing you know, the variety of different formative assessments that are available. Okay, formative assessments. Um, today we're gonna look at four types and examples. So um, I'll begin by defining each. Um, then I'll introduce you to an example to um, better familiarize you with the technique. So most of these, especially um, numbers one, two, and four are relatively quick and easy to implement. Um, the knowledge check, KWL, the minute paper, and require almost little to no planning. You could do them on the spur of the moment in your online or face-to-face -face classroom. Number three, the concept map is a bit more involved. It requires more planning, a bit more class time to execute, but it is well worth your time. So I wanted to make sure we took some time to talk about that as well. So hopefully we'll have time to look at all of these and maybe if time at the end, um, take a look at some others and get your input on what kind of formative assessments you like to use in your classroom. So Brandon, you mentioned that Poll Everywhere has yes. And actually, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because at the end of today's session, we're gonna create our own word cloud with uh, Poll Everywhere questions. So I'm gonna move that. Oh no, thank you so much. That's very helpful. Okay, so let's take a look at the first one, the knowledge check. Okay, so what is a knowledge check? Well, you probably already use knowledge checks in your classroom. You may just use them in more formal quizzes, um, but a knowledge check is essentially often also called a reading check or check your knowledge assessment is a short quiz, um, often ungraded or worth very few points. Um, 
knowledge checks are often used to confirm learner understanding of material just covered. So you might call them a pulse check, right? You administer them maybe at the end of a session or class. Um, they're often integrated into live or recorded lectures um, or during or directly following module readings. So you've probably taken self-paced learning modules where once you finished a set of readings or a set of slides, you completed a reading check, uh, maybe a set of multiple co choice questions gauging your understanding of the reading. So that is too a not kind of knowledge check formative assessment. They're often, and they should be aligned to the unit and module learning objectives. You wanna be assessing you know, what your students need to know by the end of that unit uh, or module. So the best question types for uh, knowledge checks are often multiple choice, uh, multiple response, true, false, drag and drop, matching sequence, hot spots, or clickable images, which Poll Everywhere also uses and which we'll do in a moment. Um, so the kinds of quiz questions you're used to seeing, but what ones that can be set up and can be fully automated. Um, so it doesn't require a lot of oversight on your part um, and they're sort of built in and ready to go. So with that said, again, you can utilize something like Blackboard quizzes or surveys, um, polling, or you can embed questions in Panopto with a Panopto quiz, which uh, City uh, can help set you up on. Um, into your lecture recording. And that would be a kind of knowledge check interspersing questions in your Panopto lecture recordings to again, so students can use that to gauge their understanding of the material just presented. So I, with each of these, I've brought in a helpful hint, um, which is indicated with a yellow star. Um, and my first one for knowledge checks are, uh, if you're gonna set up a knowledge check in your Blackboard course, for example, you know, add automated feedback to each answer option or to the correct answer um, to save time and reinforce learning so that students are getting um, immediate responses, immediate feedback, as long as you set it up correctly um, in response to that knowledge check question, uh, which again can help them to gauge or improve their learning. So let's do a knowledge check like question. I've tried to develop questions that were more in the realm of sort of medical education. So forgive me if it's not um, a bit remedial or if it's um, something you're not used to seeing, but I wanted to bring in just a kind of example. Um, and we'll go actually to that particular question. All right. Oh, I actually, look, I, for, I forgot a question here. Let's um, actually take this question, this poll first. Here's a multiple choice. Again, a kind of knowledge check question, checking your understanding of um, what a formative assessment is. So if you would go ahead and uh, enter A, B, C, or D for your answer, and then we'll see if you guys are following along. What is a formative assessment? Perfect, yes. All right, so 100% of you, excellent, picked a range of assessment techniques that evaluate learning while it's happening. Great, so let's go on to our other question that I initially intended. All right, this is a kind of hot spot or clickable image question that you can use with Poll Everywhere. You could also use it in your Blackboard course um, where you would have students click on a part of the image. Hopefully I've done this correctly. So asking students to identify the first metatarsal bone. Got a couple of responses. Anyone else? <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Okay, if I'm doing this correctly, it should show the correct answer, right? 
hopefully you all can see. I'm not sure. Hmm. Nope, that's the wrong one. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, it should be this guy right here, right? This big, this big toe bone. But uh, either way, you can of course utilize uh, clickable and we image questions um, in your poll everywhere um, questions. Um, and City can help you set those up if you like, um, so that you can intersperse them in your lectures um, and use them to gauge understanding and learning while it's happening, right? Which is the point of a formative assessment. So let me go back to my presentation here. Okay. All right, hopefully you guys are seeing my slides again. Please let me know if not. All right, so that's a kind of clickable image question or a hotspot question. Hold on just a moment. Sorry, I'm just getting the hang of this presentation, kind of using two screens for Zoom. I'm used to other webinar formats, so um, this is this is new to me, <laughs> maybe to some of you as well. So I don't see my notes anymore. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So again, one type of knowledge check question, actually two, since we did also define formative assessment. So. Um, let's take a look at another one. This is the KWL. You may be familiar with this, or you maybe you're familiar with it, but just don't know this is what it's called. But um, KWL essentially means or, or spells out, what do I know? What do I wonder? And what have I learned? Um, so K, no, um, W, want to know or wonder, and L, learned. Um, and KWL is a tried and true kind of strategy um, that really does help a lot with learning retention, uh, deep learning and comprehension if executed well. So KWL assessments are great for individual, um, small and large groups. Um, and what's great about KWL for, for a number of reasons is they're great at activating prior knowledge about a subject um, using sort of retrieval techniques um, and also inviting prediction, you know, what's going to happen or what will I learn, as well as reflection on that learning at the end. Um, and evidence-based re research tells us, right, that activating prior knowledge is crucial for committing new knowledge to long-term memory, right, um, as well as predicting what one might learn or what, what I wonder about um, is another, another great way, again, of sort of moving that type of learning into long-term, uh, mo moving new knowledge into long-term learning um, or long-term memory. And then reflecting, right, um, is important, right, as students sort of need to examine their own learning, engaging in the process of self-assessment, and even better critique their own assumptions about a topic, right? And reflection enables them to do that. So, KWL incorporates all of those kinds of techniques or approaches, and it's very sort of simple and direct uh, design. It's very, uh, again, simple, requires little to no planning to, to utilize, um, and often good, or essentially what you do with a KWL chart is that you utilize a written chart or table. You divide it into columns, and I'll show you in just one moment how to do that. Um, you would ask students to brainstorm what they know about a particular topic. So what would, you know, or and what they would like to know and or what they wonder about. At the end of the lesson, you would invite reflection on what they've learned and add that to the last column. So um, KWL is best executed when you sort of break it up into different parts of a lesson or a module so that um, you can contribute to that chart at, at different points in the lesson. So they're really best for kind of introductory courses, I think when you're introducing new content, but they're also good for group projects, um, independent research, maybe a student has taking on a topic uh, for a research paper, they could create a KWL chart um, to sort of, um, sort of plot out, again, what they know about a particular topic and what they like to learn. And then of course, what they've learned at the end. 
So also good for note taking and studying. And my helpful hint for that um, is that KWL charts can be coordinated even with think pair share activities, which is another great uh, formative assessment technique, um, which you can utilize uh, Zoom whiteboards for, um, or even use Blackboard wiki tools, which um, uh, city uh, instructional designers can help you set up if you're interested in learning how to use a wiki in your course. So it's essentially very basic, right? You have this chart here, this table divided into three columns. What do I know? What do I wonder? What have I learned? Um, and as I mentioned, you can use your whiteboard for that. So we're gonna try to do that. Hopefully it works out here. Can you all see my whiteboard? Okay. Hopefully you all can see it. Let me know if not. Um, so again, when utilizing, great, thanks Peg. Um, you may utilize a whiteboard to do a KWL chart. Uh, you can do that at the beginning, you know, midway, or, and also at the end of your course or, or your lesson or at any time in your lecture. So um, you might do so just by entering a text here, right? What do I know about formative assessments? So what do you guys know so far about formative assessments, either from what you've learned from me or um, what you already knew coming into this um, session, your prior knowledge on the subject, feel free to type it in your chat box. Um, and I'll add it to our KWL chart. Great, thanks, Shauna. Uh, many ways to do them. Yes. What else? Great, thanks, Shauna. Michelle, I, oh, I think you're talking. I'm gonna. Any other things you already know about formative assessments that you want to add to our KWL chart? Let me, while you do that, I'll just create our new. You know, and you may have seen maybe your kids or something do a KWL chart in their class. They're very effective also at any level of of learning, but I know my son's already created them. Oh, this is the thing about whiteboard. It doesn't let you go back. Okay, so many methods, great. Engaging students to help them learn. Thanks, Peg. Okay, great. So what do you wonder about formative assessments? And it may not even be something we've talked about. Maybe it's something of interest to you and how you would like to utilize them in your classroom. Oh, great. How do I put them in an asynchronous course? Great question. Oh, what's the best method for a variety of learning styles? Great question. Also, um, just to quickly answer Shauna's question at first. So, uh, there's, again, as you would imagine, a variety of ways you could do that. One way is to create a wiki in your Blackboard course. Uh, we could assist you with creating that. Um, and you can create a table in your wiki and then have students contribute to um, uh, the KWL chart there. But in general, a formative assessments, you know, how do you put them in an asynchronous course? You might create a Blackboard course. Quiz. You might create a Panopto quiz in your lecture. And all those could be completed asynchronously with built-in feedback for the students so that you don't really have to do anything at that point. Once you've created it, you can set it and forget it, and you can utilize it again and to reinforce the learning in your class. Um, and then just for the sake of time, we'll create our third column. You know, what have I learned? And this is something, of course, we can come back to at the end. Um, when we reflect on you know, the, what we've learned in this webinar or elsewhere about formative assessments. Um, if you utilize whiteboard tools in your class, 
you could then save this as an image once you're done, share it with your students, send it out following the end of your lecture, and then they could have, you know, for their own use, a, a completed KWL chart that they could add to um, to help them prepare for exams or whatever, or to just um, cover or review what was uh, covered in that class. So let's go back to our presentation here. the wrong one there. All right, hopefully you all can see my slides again here. All right, the third technique, we're talking about the concept map. Now, as I mentioned, concept maps, some of you might already utilize them. I know that they're widely used in medical education, particularly in nursing education, and I've seen. Um, they're, again, as I mentioned at the start, they're much more, a bit more involved, take more sort of time to plan and to execute. Um, not as spontaneous as some of the other techniques, but they are, uh, they can be very useful. Um, so what is a concept map, often called a mind map? Uh, uh, some of you who learn and, and love sort of visual representation of ideas probably really enjoy um, things like concept maps because, again, you can visualize um, your understanding of a topic. So concept maps are graphical organizers used to visualize relationships among concepts. They can be completed individually or in groups. They're really useful for showing interconnections and patterns among, among topics. So for example, uh, comorbidities in a patient. And just in terms of you know, evidence-based research on concept mapping, um, visualization really arguably fosters long-term memory retention. And, and also, I think more importantly, promotes non-linear thinking, right? Which I know is incredibly valuable in your, in your field, right? The many interconnections among things that may not be as obvious at first glance. So um, non-linear thinking and also self-directed learning, having students really have the opportunity to make connections themselves and to learn how <laughs> um, everything is interconnected is important. But as I mentioned, you know, they can be time consuming to develop and execute. Um, and they could be difficult in synchronous settings without ample class time. So um, as opposed to some of these other formative assessment techniques that may just take, you know, five minutes of your class time to rattle off a question and get some feedback from your students. Um, these are a little bit more involved, but I do think that they are worth it. And one great way to use concept maps in your class is to um, you know, utilize them as study tools in preparation for exams, have students work in groups to create concept maps um, that they can use to study. So I wanted to bring in a couple of examples again, because again, it's hard to visualize unless you can actually see one in action. And this is one I found um, when I did a search for concept maps in medical education. This is from MedEd Publish. Um, and as you can see, and I'm sure many of you are much more well versed in these connections than I am, but uh, this map focuses on a patient case, right? A 56 year old male who presents with a particular diagnosis. Um, this map sort of shows the kind of contributing factors leading to his condition, right? As well as consequences and complications that may arise. So it shows a number of things, but also, you know, causal relationships, um, as well as uh, diagnostic testing and the results of that. So um, it's, it's a fairly involved one, but, you know, if you're working on a patient case, you could use something like this or, or have your students create something like this to illustrate those connections. This one's a bit more simple, right? I know that concept maps are, and some of you probably utilize them already, and please chime in if you do in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you know, nursing education has extensively used concept maps to illustrate relationships. And this, this is one that I found, just you know, simple search on Pinterest, for example. Um, the connections have already been made here in this pathophysiology concept map, um, and then, but a lot of extra space is left for students to sort of write in um, the information that they've learned through study or through class or through lecture um, regarding this particular patient. So again, a lot of, you can easily create them in Word or PowerPoint. 
Um, they're quite simple or can be executed simply if needed. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily revolve a ton of time on your part, but can be really useful for students um, to help learn again about those interconnections and causal kind of relationships. So here's a simple guide on creating a concept map. Um, there are many ways to go about this and not just one way. So please don't um, take this to be the only way you can do it, but um, this is a good place to start. So for, you might begin with selecting a topic, maybe a disease state or a patient case as in that first one we looked at. Um, or you might start with a question, which I think is a nice way to go about it. And I've put an example of one here. You know, what types of complications can result for people with diabetes who contract COVID-19? Um, and this could pertain to content or a topic introduced in lecture or reading. Um, in order to sort of better organize those ideas, oh, I'm showing my, okay, my presenter screen. Oh, can you see both my notes? And oh, thank you, Brandon, appreciate that. Told you it's getting the hang of it, making sure I'm doing the right thing. Oh, I see that, thank you. Okay, well, you can see my notes here to myself, right? Let's go back, hopefully this will fix it. Thanks, Brandon. Oops, did that fix it? Great, thank you so much for telling me. Um, okay, so uh, in order to sort of better organize uh, you could, you would begin by sort of listing your concepts um, from that topic and then ranking them, beginning with the more general to the more specific. A lot of concept maps are hierarchical in that they um, sort of pre present the most general uh, topic at the top, top or in the center, as you can see here, right, with this kind of top-down approach, actually top-down approach at the bottom here, this hierarchy map. Um, or the spider map here on the right that shows the main topic in the center with subtopics that are more specific radiating out from that center. Um, and then you would begin to organize them visually, right? Enclosing texts with circles, squares, however you choose to graphically represent them, um, and then linking them, right, with words. Um, and or linking them with lines and arrows to show direction and to show relationships among those concept, concepts or topics. Um, and then students can, you know, make connections among new things, right? Maybe, maybe it's looking at the, uh, again, comorbidities involved in different types of diseases um, or different types of symptoms that arise from those comorbidities. So, um, you could visualize that in a concept map and student could, students could draw those connections on their own or you could do it together in class or as a group. So it's a great way, I think, uh, a great tool to sort of visualize those relationships. And again, because, um, because it's so involved, we're not gonna have time to really create a concept map together in this session, um, but I hope you'll, uh, you'll do that or have done that on your own. And of course, reach out to City should you need any help um, in facilitating that in your course. So the last one I wanted to look at, again, because it's fairly simple and easy to implement is the minute paper. Uh, and I wanted to look at that last because it's a great way to kind of wrap up uh, a session or a lecture um, and really get a lot of information from the students on how well um, they understand something or maybe they don't. And this will help you to really gauge that. Um, this was a technique that I believe Angelo introduced in his classroom assessment techniques books that's become quite popular, I think because of the ease of which uh, it can be implemented. Um, so the minute paper is essentially a short one minute or you can <laughs> adjust that to your needs assessment um, that's often administered during or often directly after or at the end of a lesson. So students might respond in writing to one to two questions that they would hand into the instructor at the end of a lesson. You know, traditionally this would be done in a classroom setting on a piece of paper. And as the students exit the classroom, they would just, you know, hand in their uh, responses to the questions on a piece of paper that the instructor would collect and review after class. Um, minute papers are really effective when they focus 
on main ideas introduced in class. So um, the readings or the lecture, um, really distilling the lecture into the main takeaway points. You know, what do you really want your students to learn and have grasp at the end of that lecture or unit? Minute papers are also great because they can be used to provide rapid feedback on lesson material. Um, for example, if you could use a minute paper, and this is my little star uh, point here, uh, to, bring, to bring in the responses at the start of the next class for reinforcement and clarification. So um, say you get a handful of responses to questions. Uh, you take those home, you organize them into separate piles according to the kinds of feedback you get, the kinds of concepts that are unclear to students, then you can bring those comments shared anonymously with your class to the next class at the start to sort of either clarify concepts that are unclear to students or to answer questions that they may have. So they allow for really quick feedback um, and students can use it very easily to self-assess their own learning. So they can be highly adaptable. You can customize questions to your liking and they're easy to assess. Often they're not graded, they're often anonymous. You just collect those responses from your students at the end. So there's a variety of ways you could um, use uh, minute papers or you, a variety of tools you could use to um, do a minute paper in your class. You could use polling um, or your chat box uh, with Zoom to collect responses. Those of course would be you know, typically tied to a student's name, so they wouldn't be anonymous. Or you could have students submit using Blackboard assignments directly after class, maybe using a survey tool um, or perhaps a discussion board to post response to a particular question you ask about that, about today's topic or that day's topic. Um, so they're very versatile um, and can really be adjusted to your liking. So I wanted to include an example of one. Um, we're going to do utilize Blackboard's uh, chat, I'm sorry, Zoom's chat uh, board here to collect your responses as opposed to say you handwriting them. Um, but imagine this were a minute paper you were completing at the end of a session, jotting it down or taking a moment to reflect and then jotting down your answers and handing them in. Um, you might pose a question like this. What are the one to two most significant things you have learned so far during this workshop? Feel free to answer in your chat box and I'll be watching that and following along. Take a minute to reflect, of course, if you need to. It is a minute paper. Again, the question is here and you're asked to respond using your chat box here. What are the one to two most significant things you've learned so far during this workshop? Oh, great. Thanks, Shauna. So four different types of assessments. All are unique and assess in their own way. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Michelle says, quick formative assessments that won't significantly increase faculty workload. Exactly. And that is the name of the game. And that's why I wanted to talk about this today, right? Um, Peg, the different interactions being demonstrated here live has been very useful. It's one thing to hear about tools, another to see them in action. Thanks so much, Peg. Appreciate that. Um, great. We'll go on to the next question, which is an, a, a typical kind of question you're likely to see in minute papers, right? Because um, you really want to see whether or not your students are understanding what you're teaching them. You can have a very simple question that asks them that, right? What questions remain uppermost in your mind? Is there anything you did not understand? Feel free to type that in your chat box if you have any questions or need clarification on anything. I believe there might be some delay and maybe that's why I'm not seeing things immediately. Okay, great. Thanks, Shannon. 
Um, one of the issues I str struggle with, Shannon writes, is that I get a lot of feedback regarding best way to provide or assess information for individual learners, but then it turns into seven different individualized courses based on student request. Interesting. Um, That's really interesting. I, I wonder if you if you could either elaborate on that, Shannon, maybe with your microphone or you know in a separate uh, communication. Because I'm really curious as to what exactly you mean by seven different individualized courses. Yeah. So, for example, some students prefer that um, lectures be pre-recorded so that they can review them. Some students like the live lecture. Some students want everything recorded so they can review after. And it just feels like it's a lot of different requests. And then it turns into a lot of different. Um, it's just a lot of work for me. But I yeah. want to be able to meet my students' needs. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great question. Does, do any of you have any thoughts on how to address that? Um, any feedback from, you know, those in the audience? This is Peg. If you don't mind, I'll jump in with it. Yeah, please do. What I tell people. So what I usually suggest is that um, you present, that faculty members present live, record the, rec don't do a pre-recording, in other words, do a post-recording. At the same time, you can do if you do voice to text, you can create a transcript. So that creates your your written lecture notes, if you will. So you're kind of killing three birds with one stone. And then you post your lecture as soon as it's rendered and processed, you post it up so the people that want to see it can and watch it on their own time can do that. The people that want to join you live can do that. The people that want to read that can take your transcript and read that. So it's all it's all done in one shot. That's great word of advice, Peg. And Brandon has said, I recommend making the lecture pre-recorded and using the live session for more. Peg, you wanna take that next question? How do you do a voice to text transcript? Oh, sure. It, um, it depends on your machine. I use a Mac and I just click on my command button twice and my dictation software comes right up. There are programs you can use. I've used, I've used Dragon Dictate um, very effectively um, and they do have a medical version for Dragon Dictate. It's a little bit more pricey, but it's, it's well, worth the, well worth the investment um, because it captures all the terminology and whatnot. Um, and yeah, Brandon, I agree with you about, about using the session, the live session for interactive stuff. That's, that's in our ideal world, that's what we want to use that live session for. Because especially in a, in, a, in a virtual environment, you know, it's, it's ever so much better to have interaction during that time so people stay engaged. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another great question. And I don't even know, if you know if that's possible. Can you put a knowledge check into a screencast-o-matic recording? Shauna's asking about that. Do any of you know? I, I, I don't believe so, but I could be wrong. Brandon uh, or Peg, do you know? Let me take a quick peek. I don't believe so either, but I can no, take a I don't believe so, but I know you can do it in Panopto for sure. Yeah. And, and the other you thing you can do, uh, I see Sean, this is Brandon. Shauna, <laughs> that you said you can't um, use Panopto. We can talk about that offline. But in Microsoft Stream, uh, which is part of the Office, uh, Microsoft Office Suite that everyone at Rush has access to, you can insert uh, knowledge uh, questions uh, using Microsoft Forms very easily. Uh, so that could be another option as well. So very similar to like Panato's. Uh, video quizzes, you can okay. do the same with thing us. with uh, Microsoft more Stream more uh, and uh, it, with you. that as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brandon. And um, thanks to all of you. Those are some great suggestions. Also, Shauna, I mean, you, you know, I, that's a, I, I'll investigate that. I think Peg's doing that as well. Yeah, and it just um, came can, up that you oh, can yeah, do go it. Ahead. You can. You can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a tutorial on how to, to do that you could share with us, Peg? As a matter of fact, there is. Wonderful. Look at that. Great. Thanks, Peg. You bet. All right. Well, we only have four minutes left, so I'm going to jump right back into our presentation, but I'm glad we were able to answer some of your minute paper questions. Um, keep them coming if you have other questions you would like City to help you with. We're happy to do that. It's, um, that's a pretty good demonstration of how effective those one minute papers can be. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Had no idea. But that's, I think, a great thing about 
the minute paper is that it can tell you things and, 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 and students ask, ask questions that you would never even anticipate, right? But you could, you know, close that feedback loop, could provide them with real time answers to their problems um, so that, you know, any of these unclear concepts or issues can be addressed at that time. Um, so just a few best practices in formative assessments. Um, Identify, you know, identify accessible questions where responses can really be used to influence teaching and provide concrete feedback, right? They may be more general like the minute paper questions, but um, things that are really tied to and aligned with your overall module and course of objectives, right? So again, students are grasping what you want them to learn or take away from that session or module. And I would also recommend, you know, try it yourself first. Uh, experiment. A lot of these rely on tech tools that are um, somewhat, you know, you know, require some experimentation first to master, as you can see. And you know, my kind of uh, stumbling upon a couple, a couple of these during this session. Um, oh, thanks, Brandon. So appreciate the resources on Microsoft Stream. Um, so feel free to check that out if you need some help with that. Um, also plan how you're gonna evaluate student responses. What are you gonna do with the results that you get? How are you gonna use them to you know, improve your own teaching or to, to assist students with their own learning? And I would recommend that you be as transparent as possible. Obviously don't share what specific students are struggling with. You know, Make it anonymous, share it with the class and, and, and be transparent. Tell them why you're, a lot of students, you know, they might see a knowledge check as just another quiz that they have to complete and they might be overwhelmed by that. But if, you, if you're clear and transparent as to why you're using that and how you believe that that will reinforce your objectives for that lesson or for the course and what the purpose of it is, I think students will start to get the hang of it um, and, um, you know, to understand why you're doing it. And again, closing that feedback loop. We're almost done, let me jump ahead. Uh, I can, happy to, this is being recorded and I'm happy to share the slide deck with those of you that are interested. Um, but here's some other good formative assessment techniques. Uh, there's so many, it takes, you know, it's nearly impossible to, to look at all of them, um, especially in an hour. But these are some you might already do that are really great. Um, such as the summary or the muddiest point question, um, a background knowledge pro, bringing in students' prior knowledge of a subject at the start of a course um, so that you can gather information about what they already know and make adjustments as needed. Um, and then some tech tools for formative assessments. We've already talked about a few of these, but um, here I've just used or shown in a list form which tech tools are good for which certain kinds of assessments, like knowledge checks, you could use Poll Everywhere, Blackboard quizzes, minute papers, you could use Blackboard assignments for um, wikis, you could use wikis, you could use for KWL, etc. And then there are links to a lot of other tools that can be useful for both concept maps and other types of formative assessment techniques. So please um, contact City, you know, for tool setup or troubleshooting if you need some assistance with any of these, some of which, you know, city supports and provides support uh, for its use. So a um, lot out there, a lot to play with. Um, this is only the tip of the iceberg here. So um, here are my references. It is one o'clock, but I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes if you guys have any questions. Um, and of course, do contact city um, if, you, if you have any questions or you need support with any of these tools or resources, we can help you develop and implement them. And there's my email below. Thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, hope to be back with you soon to share more um, instructional design tips and tools. But I, again, I will stick around for questions as needed. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks, Shannon.